Welcome to the Community Changemakers Podcast with Siraj Syed of Your Authentic Self Work and Sue Blythe of the Future Flash Project, part of the 11 Days of Global Unity 11 Campaigns for Change, sponsored by We the World, online at we.net, and hosted by the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice. Today, we explore the environment with Nicole Linius, who is a community activist focusing on utilizing natural spaces as experiential teaching and learning frameworks to engender a deeper understanding within youth minds of not only the value of eco-conservation, but also their place within the cycle of life and their responsibility to it. Nicole is an ethicist, a philosopher, and a scientist who values a stance of personal inquiry as the means for sustainable growth. So join me, Siraj Sayed, and Sue Blythe as we speak with Nicole about how she sees life through a joint lens of systematic awareness and inquiry. She's very much invested in this idea around the generally what the Florida Earth Charter and the Earth Charter principles represent, right? So the idea that the main ones are, you know, there's environmental justice, but there's also caring for the community of life, there's social justice, there's peace. It's pretty all-encompassing, so it speaks to a brilliant vision. But what I like about that is that there's a lot of ways in, and then we're talking really in that model, particularly about space in which we could explore intersectionality too. And you have articulated that beautifully at the time that I've seen you. I'm so glad we got what you said relative to the individuals we're talking about restorative justice in this other podcast. It, it, it beautifully showed us the levels at which we all exist and where we can all plug in because that's the audience. People want to get in the mix, right? So, um, so Sue definitely was remiss not to be able to be here because she would have connected very well. But so she represents conscious elders network as one of the things she represents. And these individuals really want to connect. She has ideas in mind, some stuff she's piloted, like a digital mentors program working with youth. Her area of youth is very early childhood, probably through fifth grade. And there's other spaces in which people have worked uh, with high school kids, even in this community, with you holds um, uh, Gainesville High School. And then there's you saying that it is working in youth development through natural spaces and then generating programs like that and doing that kind of work. So the potentiality is dead, right? That sounds brilliant. And I think there is something very visible and something very amazing that can kind of come out of that. When I say visible, I mean with impact, with outcomes that we can represent and communicate and declare relative to spaces of community-based work and change, relative to educational attainment, even. So there's a lot of different stuff that come out of it. Um, so you plug right into that, and a lot of this stuff came out of your head. So if you allow me to be ageist just for a moment, what's up? Why do you have your mind so much together around this stuff, whereas others that I've worked with, I mean, Joking aside, work with in even in uh, you know their first year grad students, maybe around your age group in terms of health profession students. And one of the themes for this eleven days of global unity stuff we did was around health, right? And how we develop health practitioners, how they perceive individuals, whether it's from this sick need to fix deficit base, and we're comparing we're going deep, we're comparing that to how religious cultural institutions also who are a deficit right. something is wrong. And we, if we establish this authority dependence, can heal you, can bring you through, you know, whatever the case is. And we're talking about that. And uh, when I did work with the University of Florida and the Health Sciences Center with individuals in this age group, they not only did not carry those values, but they they had pushed aside those values. And when you dug a little bit deeper into narratives, those values were there. They came up with them. They came up with values that still stem from their family structures, from, from the communities they lived in. But when they came to this space of intentionalizing a particular professional path, so I'm not just talking about people who are like, you know, 
I got up till three in the morning every night of the week. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there is a determined turning away from a particular kind of awareness of the world we live in and our place in it to a very narrow view of something. So that I've seen a lot. You, in my experience, are out there. So how did you get here? <laughs> what, what developed all this, you know? Um, I've known for most of my life that I wanted to be a scientist. So um, unlike a lot of well, a lot of my peers who I've spoken to, I sort of had that early direction. Um, and I was very lucky too because as I went through school and as I've gone through some of my early career, um, I've noticed I've <laughs> noticed that it's, it's much more difficult um, to find weird spaces to grow um, when you're sort of when you're when you're reaching out. I felt lucky that I've had a, a sort of a lens to be able to do that with, sort of a vein to be able to travel through. Um, but it's not specific, and and I think that's sort of what you're you're getting at. Um, when I went into school, I went into school thinking that I was going to do that, that science was sort of there was direct science and that was science and that's what it was. Um, and then I started reading, we started doing work in other studies um, in sociology and psychology, and they were all the same formatted work. So you can do the work of investigating and asking questions and then finding a metric for measurement and then determining uh, sort of what values you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for some kind of result, testing it, and then evaluating your results. That pattern was replicated throughout everything that I was sort of seeing around me. And uh, this was around the time also when I got into philosophy um, and ethics. So I started studying ethics and um, just absolutely fell in love with it because um, it has this it has a, a regiment to it as a study, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's far more observational and uh, there's an allowance for human um, experience. for human experience yeah. that there that we yeah. that we call error yeah. uh, in, in, in the more um, I don't know regiments and sciences what yeah. we call that but in the more physical sciences. Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought you were going for that, and hence why I said experience mm -hmm. because how do we maintain a standard of objectivity if we're not necessarily seeing things from a very holistic lens which must necessarily incorporate instability, the unknown, something that cannot necessarily be readily explained but must necessarily be felt, you know, perhaps, and, 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 and consider all of these pathways also streams of data that we can we can do something with. It may not be the same thing that we do here, and it may not yield the same kind of degree of certainty, but it it paints a connective picture, it creates kind of a fabric that we can start making sense of things out of in different ways, right? So so hence why I said human experience, because I just tend to want to imbue those particular words into every thing that I'm doing, because it's not only in the, the, in the kind of the rigidity of sciences and academic structures, but policy-based spaces. I mean, it's just not there. And it's not there because it's it's not really perceived as a value. And in the most simplest expression, it's perceived as a deficit. It's mm -hmm. something that we don't want. We want to control for that, right? So, so this is important, right? But let's let's because I love this progression that you're getting into. But you're one of those like three and a half hour podcasts. Like that's a hard one. So <laughs> for the purpose of our viewers here, like, we'll just definitely say we'll get back to that down the road. But let's start with science because I want to really pursue a particular pathway that I like to pursue through this developmental meaning that we might do. It's simple. That's not rocket science. It's values, anchors, practice. That's just what we're trying to kind of move through right here. So this value of having been given this beautiful space to grow in uh, of scientific inquiry, right? Like right from the start, early on, uh, something that was generated in you, something I hope I do, seeing someone like you and then thinking of 
my eight-year-old son, just this idea of asking questions and doing things in different ways, trying things out, even though sometimes, even now, on the school or for a homework assignment comes in and says, you didn't do this, this, and this, requiring me to write and say, I get that. And you know what? I don't read the directions either. I just get a sense of what that assignment was. But did you take a look at his, his poetic expression, right? Like, he wrote a poem based on spelling words that he received, but the comment was, yeah, this was awesome, but you didn't underline the words that you used in the poetic structure of you know, mm -hmm. what you wrote. But he not only wrote this, but then he did a little video that was posted to his YouTube channel, right? Like, just dropping right. fire, just spoken word, right? Getting, getting, out, getting that out. And I thought, uh, mm -hmm. this is the problem. Like, this is what's happening right now. We just are existing in this particular space of value that somehow, like I mentioned, these you know, health professions, grad students, it just becomes such a narrow expression of what life could be. And the idea of the systemic awareness you gain from being able to see life through a science lens, as you said, but also having the spirit of constant inquiry, um, I gotta say, how is it possible that has not been beaten out of you yet? Right? Like, how, how did that maintain all these years? School, peers, right. well, I generally say parents, I have an awareness of your parents' influence in your life, so a bit of parents, family, uh, work, job spaces, even the ones that seem like there's a lot I can do here, but the bureaucracy, the, the human politics, and even office spaces, the hierarchical issues, and all of these kind of things, have you had a remarkably charmed life, or have you done something else to kind of keep this with you until now? Um, I've definitely worked to keep it with me. Um, but it's something that I I see as um, that I'm doing my observational work. So I'm still in the observational stage, and, and so I get to see, um, as I'm in all of these spaces, even like the bureaucratic spaces, this is where there's yeah. These hierarchies and um, that that process is something that I see everywhere, and I mm -hmm. I think that it's something that I try to to communicate and to try to give. So it's not something yet that has been sort of uh, like there's nothing encroaching on you on it yet, um, because I still feel like it's so much of a. Um, an outpouring and something that I'm only, you know, just getting into observationally, um, which is which is sort of how I got interested in it. Is is when when I was in ethics and I started studying um, ethics and speaking to to moral philosophers, um, I sort of recognized the same the same patterns of, of um, experiment and discovery and. Mm. Um, and I wondered why uh, we had stopped. I mean, you mentioned um, like health, the health world is, is a really good example of this, um, and, and as are academics and um, sort of the scientific method mm -hmm. as a whole, um, is that it's, uh, can you repeat the three stages that you said just a moment ago? Yeah, I just, it's, it's the progression that I work with people is to kind of Identify values, set anchors, and then establish practice. You know, so it's right. another, and, and that is kind of contingent on the same kind of, I mean, it all comes out of you know, Thomas Kuhn's of, you know, scientific revolutions, the idea that mm -hmm. once you're there, the evaluative component is called consolidating gains, so that you can see where you come from, you can see what you hold, see what you release. Right. And the process begins with an understanding of the, the cognitive dissonance you're finding yourself in, which is identify the problem, right? So it's the same progression, right? And it's the same idea. It's just this one tracks a little bit more of the human experience, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's just where I kind of took it to. But uh, yeah, so you've seen that at play right. even in spaces which are kind of a different kind of, whether it's metaphysical, whether it's moral inquiry. So what did you gain? From seeing this kind of universal human pattern, the, the, that is in fact the, the universal human pattern. Like there are values that guide anchors, that guide practices. And what I found is that I was finding I was, I was coming up against a lot of practices that had lost anchors, 
or that had completely lost sight of the values that had guided them in the first place. Um, and so I was in a, I was doing a thesis, I was doing a research project with um, the Department of Biology at my, uh, at my school when I was um, in college, and there were so many uh, opportunities for me to ask, for me to, to improve my process, and to have made it a more, a, a, to improve the depth of the experience, like to deepen the experience of it, and to make it more human, um, that I didn't feel invited to in the process itself. I didn't feel invited to those inquiries in, within the process. Um, and I wondered why we had, uh, I wondered why it was, I had come to the point where the, the thing that I got into for my values and for my anchors um, didn't feel invited to investigate the other way. Um, and I wondered how much of, of, um, of our processes and our practices of our sort of daily lives were, um, could be um, investigated, could be, could be dug into, could be um, enlivened by the investigation and by the discovery of anchors and of those values. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how can I deepen those and change those based on my experiences with other people and my experiences with other trades and with other, um, you know, dimensions and disciplines. Um, so in, in the health field, um, those students that, that, that you were sort of describing that, that hadn't... Um, I mean, right. They were, because we, yeah. and, and one thing you said was that you're trying to bring the word experience into things because we've separated all of these uh, disciplines, because we've separated everything out and named them different things. We've lost the similarities in those patterns. Um, and that's something that, that's the thing that, that sort of drives me, is I don't think that there's, I, th I think we're, I think that in terms of progression, in terms of motion, we're all doing the same motions, but calling them very different things. And by saying that you're that that where you're moving and the ways that you're moving, the things that you're creating are different from the things that I'm creating. I'm losing insight into what I'm doing, and I'm losing insight into you and what you're doing, and why you're doing it, and how you're making it, and why I'm making what I'm making, or whatever. Okay, so I'm glad we've come to this point and we've had the benefit of speaking about this previously in terms of okay, so that there's definitely kind of a, some groundwork that we laid, but I think that groundwork was important to come to this understanding because so too is your expression of your narrative in this way kind of outlined a path, right? So there's a push that's been there for, I don't know, in my mind might be definitively in this particular way as far as 80 years of about kind of moving towards an integral expression of practice of method, whatever the case may be. Um, you also might be the person who finally kind of you know finds that holy grail in this, in this general field of inquiry I would call it rather than even science that people are pursuing as like a grand unification here around how we understand our human experience in, in this universe, right? So has anything from those spaces resonated with this idea? Because you have a very much of an intention that always emerges about integrating practice, integrating disciplines, integrating spaces, integrating experiences, and no one experience, even in your expression of pedagogy, doesn't necessarily need to Okay, everyone, let's sit there. This is, we're going to be doing biology today, as opposed to experiential learning. I mean, there's, these things are there. I always come to this expression of my current awareness where there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of programs, there's a lot of people doing a whole lot of great stuff. And uh, there's also a whole lot that's not really changing in our general human experience. So what the hell, right? Like, well, why is that happening? And I'm not sure that, yeah, at the very least, that particular dichotomy positions me in a place where I'm not just assuming that change is happening. 
right? But it's important to still be talking about this in 2018, two decades into the 21st century, and yet these are still relevant questions. Why aren't things like this working? So, what does integrated learning, integrated experiencing, integrated teaching, integrated professional collaboration, out of everything, right? What is the benefit to that? What is the benefit to understanding a more whole sense of the experience? Um, my favorite example, one of my favorite examples of, um, of that that I came across is, or that, that I encountered is, um, especially in the past, uh, 20, 30 years, we've had lots of studies um, come out in cognitive science, in behavioral science, in um, animal studies, on specifically on the cognition of animals. Yes. Um, and there's been a lot of work done with fish. Mm -hmm. um, and fish are sort of the, the least of those when it comes to, I mean, there are people who. Uh, capacity, yeah. Right, right. In terms of compassion, or, yeah, capacity for, for empathy, fish yeah. are one of the last to go. <laughs> yeah. um, and and there's been there has been a lot of work lately, and there was a particularly interesting study that came out earlier a few years ago. It was published in 2015. I can't remember between 2010 and 2015. I don't want to yeah. incorrect about the dates, but um, that showed that fish uh, can actually recognize faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that had no impact on fisheries, fisheries management, it had no impact on uh, our human experience of the idea of a fish, um, contrary to the way that we would see dogs, or the way that we would see like octopuses, which we think are, are octopi, which we think are so intelligent, because there's this idea that they're very smart, and that they're, they're intelligent, they're a different type of animal than a fish. Um, but these studies that have come out, so what's the value of the study? What's the value of all these theories that are coming out? What's the value of, of all this work that's being done if it's not changing our actual human experience of the thing itself? Mm -hmm. And so collectively, even just the US, we didn't find out about the study and then all collectively decide if our metric for uh, proper treatment of animals has to do with their cognition, mm -hmm. something that we use. That's one of the metrics we use, but as a society, we decided that's one of the metrics that we use, and also something that seems to point to empathy or understanding or um, capacity of, of like understanding of self and other. Um, if that's going to be our metric for the way that we determine the hierarchy of animals, the hierarchy of all living things, oh, that would, yeah. right? Um, yeah. If those are our metrics, then how come things that uh, that seem to go contrary to what our current beliefs are, why isn't that revolutionary? Mm -hmm. Why isn't that changing our greater um, understanding of things in a way that, that has this domino effect down the line, all the way down to practices that shouldn't mm -hmm. start a practice, that should change the value, that should change the understanding mm -hmm. of the thing? Um, and I, I think that's part of what you're asking. Um, and that's the challenge that I've run up to in, in I, I mean, I call it science, but um, just the, yeah, just all, all the different sort of scientific disciplines that, that mm -hmm. sort of follow the same uh, track of mm -hmm. doing work, doing research, getting published, the, that sort of, of, of action. Um, the idea that we are doing that for the purpose of changing, I don't think it's is as widely accepted anymore. I think, or as widely understood and willingly. Um, I think that 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 once we in the Enlightenment decided that uh, this would be the process of this, this would be how we did the thing. Um, I think that we've come so far down the line, um, and there's so many. I mean, now now it's not just that there's a process; it's that there's you know, millions of people doing the process. And so how do you revolutionize, how do you ask questions about the whole process when there are nine million other people doing it? Um, and what are you gonna, you know, if, if your study is, is, to, is to revolutionize something, there are also nine million other studies that, are, that were created, that were set up. The, the, the function of the study was set up to change the way that we think. 
But now there's just there's a lot of them, and we sort of lost sight of the value of the process itself and sort of why it it it, it comes to be. Mm-hmm. And one of the places recently, um, one of the places that that's really coming to uh, a clash, it's really just, um, is in data science mm-hmm. because data science is something that sort of happened overnight. Um, and we, we've seen um, that there are just awful detrimental uh, consequences to using data science at its base value. Yeah. Um, even though that's what um, <laughs> that's what it, it that's what it's made for. Oh, okay, so here's the statistic, here's what we can show, here's what we do with it, okay. here's how to implement it. That seems to make sense. Well, we've seen that that leads to uh, you know discrimination if it's, if it's used in policing practices and um, it can eliminate one one um, one woman that um, I'm aware of who's working in the field. She actually has started her own um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a foundation or, or what it is, but she sort of um, spearheaded this um, <laughs> movement in data science that is all about uh, a, a, an application of data science that involves justice, a justifiable. Um, allocation of data science. Um, and she actually got into it because she worked in IT, in IT she worked in, in tech, and she was helping develop the um, facial recognition software. Yes. And the um, set of data that was given to the algorithm that sort of determined the, I don't know what that sure, sure. But the set, of, the set of data that was given to, um, to the system so they could learn to recognize faces, um, was just a general survey, which means that it was shaped like felt So in terms of skin tone, so there were very few of the darker skin tones, very few of the lightest skin tones. There were a lot in the center, like you and I. Um, and what she found, she was, she's a very dark skinned woman, and she found that she, it never it didn't recognize her. She was creating something that didn't recognize her. Incredible. But it would recognize her friends with incredible accuracy. So she would get something like a 73% accuracy reading, uh, whereas her friends would be like 99.9% that would be acceptable amount confidence of, yeah. right, that's a confidence interval, right? Um, so, but they would get recognized to an acceptable degree, yeah. um, but, she, but she wasn't. And so she said like, this isn't something wrong with the system. This isn't something wrong with the data set. The data set is what it is. We took a, that's a span of what the data set looks like. It is a dog. That's what it looks like. Like, that's what their data set looks like. And she said, the problem isn't that, it's that we're developing this, like, it's, it's, the problem is in our application of it. The problem is, is in the system itself. Sure. Um, in, in, and in what we communicate down the line when we look at things at face value without asking, how are we applying this? What does it mean to apply it this way? Are there better ways to apply it? Who are we leaving out? Mm-hmm. And how can we do this more, how can we do this better? Um, mm-hmm. and, and her field and what she's sort of getting into is something that we are going to be called to as a society in the next you know, 15, 20 years. And we're already starting to, um, especially around AI, we're doing this sort of retroactive <laughs> digging into whether or not we should be doing what we are with AI. Um, and so we talk about driver of cars, but we've already made them. We, but now we're talking about the ethical uh, sort of consequences that are, or whether or not we want to go there. It's like, okay, what does it mean to be about my ability to be human if driving something that we do um, that sort of separates us from that community? About this thing that we're making, we're now asking the question about the word on this car, and we're already questioning this question. So it's sort of that, that retroactive. So it's interesting that you're speaking about the idea of questioning whether we should long after we have already done so, right? And that, that, that's that's an interesting idea because in kind of more general spaces, the, the questioners of that particular question 
are individuals who are, even at least from a stance of uh, a professional ethic, are approaching the circumstance with the idea that we, well, we do have to evaluate these outcomes and how we're getting there, and, and that's an important part of this, even if it kind of plays a part. The thing that I've started to see that is especially of concern, and it, it kind of leads to this other space that we've started to kind of go into, and it's, it's kind of making certain connections with, with, you know, just kind of the, what I like about speaking to you is that you pull down these different spaces in my experience, so I'm kind of a, a memory space, they start drawing together, so you're, you're, you have some kind of connective energy, right, that you just like, <laughs> magnetically pull all these things together. I should have had you during our college exams, and that would have been great, like, just spend time with Nicole, and then I'll just ace everything, because it'll all be fresh in my head, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a great value, and I, and I say that jokingly, but also I say it that however your path is moving forward, it seems like the types of capacities that you have, especially the synergistic capacity, it's kind of the same thing that I found that I'm going to do with what I'm doing now, right? So I don't think these fields are defined yet. Like we we're defining them as we go, as the kind of people we are, how we are, occupying the white spaces between all that there is and all that there is known. So it's kind of people who are unafraid to go into the unknown, right? Um, but what I was speaking about just a moment ago is this idea that what's really creeping me out more so, and so that's a very wide statement, but more so than driverless cars is smartphones, right? And when you bring up the idea of how we are approaching as a society, how we're approaching AI, I mean, it's from two standpoints. The best kinds of theater and entertainment that we can get to relative to AI is that it's horrifying. In one way, they are horrifying in the sense that it wants to do away with the human species, that's the fire, so this planet, you know, that kind of idea, or in kind of more subtle ways where a more kind of sentient AI that takes on human form, whatever the case is, I've seen some films that I won't name and get into recently about the expression around the fact that there's this real question of, well, we have now become this, you know, burgeoning kind of pluralistic society of artificial, artificially intelligent entities, whatever the case that is, and we have more of a right to exist than you do because you do more for the environment in which we live. We live more in balance with that kind of idea. So those are horrifying themes for a lot of people, and I say horrifying in the sense that they're they're thrillers, they're horror, adventure, you know, kind of, oh no, what if that happened? Let's kill it all before it begins. And that's how we're speaking about it. But at the same time, there are all these commercials. So marketing is being done around AI presence in our home, and we're just relinquishing information, identity, agency. Like there was something that I recently saw, I can't think specifically about it, but the tagline was, let this do it when you just don't feel like doing that thing. And whatever it was, whether it was checking to make sure that everything is you know, not expired in the fridge and ordering it automatically or whatever it is. The idea that you're relinquishing that agency when you don't feel it, right? You don't feel like getting up, you don't feel like doing anything. And to me, marrying the two, the reality and the fiction, is that that's how the process begins, where we relinquish agency as entities and then just you know, can likely float off into a state of virtual bliss and living in some utopic, creative world. But this world that we're living in, we relinquish the agency within, right? So, if we're talking about that, then let's talk about progress, right? You said that data science has moved very quickly as a field because the, the database of the human of the human existence has grown exponentially very quickly, even in the past 30 years. I, don't know, that, 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 I mean, when I was in college, and if about a decade beyond that, I didn't feel so married to technology. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like I cannot get along with that, just in terms of a, a personal expression, because I can't, I can't connect with everyone without it 
there was a whole methodology in place for how you and I connected to come here today. And I couldn't imagine doing it otherwise, right? So it was that kind of idea. But in terms of progress, relative to your concept, like you mentioned your colleague at the beginning, a, a very kind of justice-oriented under, understanding of, should we be doing this? Is this the right way to go with all of this? Let's make some decisions along the way so we don't end up with a much larger problem down the road. And, oh, do we have some functionality where this thing can speak to this thing and cut out that part of our experience that we're really annoyed with anyway, like paying that bill or going shopping for something? Let's just run with it, right? Run with security for our homes, run with driverless cars, because we all have so many other things to do than just focus on the moment of conveying ourselves to the place we want to go. If that's the case, then how does that impact you? How does that impact you when there is this very large momentum swell over here in terms of just doing the next thing better, that there is a war on to be able to capitalize in that space? And here you are saying, we should really think about what we're doing here. So how is that voice going to impact this progression of the human species? Um. Yeah. Or just, <laughs> that, that becomes right. a great culling of the human race. And those of us who are aware, right. follow Nicole, <laughs> you, 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 you're, you're, it will be one of those films, you know, like dystopic films where your granddaughter is saying, my granddaughter started this movement where we question everything, and that's why we're alive and everyone else is. There's only four million human beings left on the planet. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, you know, there's a, there's a harsh way of looking at it in the sense that any species that grew out of balance with the world in which they live, with the, within the ecosystem in which they live, was selected out. I mean, that's how it happened. It may have happened over a long period of time, whatever the case is. So there is this idea that we're playing with something where we've, I don't know, have we identified ourselves as demigods on this planet, nothing affects us, we can do whatever we want to do, and we consider ourselves removed from the impacts of the ecosystem, or is that a terribly myopic and, and, and dangerous way of Right, so where do you stand relative to that? Uh, in terms of impact, um, I, I think about progress and I see these, I see better and better and better. We can do this better. We can, um, I can pay your bill easier than, you know, if I do it on my phone, it's easier than walking all the way in and having to do the thing, do it that way. And, and many of those things are great. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Right. So there is that, but. Right. How do we build in just a touch of restraint to actually question whether the next thing is even necessary, right? right? In terms of just expenditure of resources. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not against. I'm not against better. Yeah. I think. Um, what is it better at? Mm -hmm. So if I if I can hit a button on my phone and pay my bill, the payment of the bill goes faster. But I get further away of my understanding of my paying for my maybe this rent. Then I get I get further away from understanding that there are things that I sacrifice to take up space. I'm paying rent on my apartment. It goes through my phone. It goes through the bank. It goes through money. It's currency. It's fine. I have money left over. I don't even know. I don't even really need to know. You know how much is how much is left? I've set enough aside. I've done the work. I don't have to think about it as a sacrifice, um, and that changes the way that I think about my space and about my life and cost. And and I think that some of those things have you know been made better. I, you know the, the way that technology has made some things better. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going towards the sort of cliche of like, we don't talk to each other enough. <laughs> but it's it, it takes away from your understanding of what it means to to do those things. Like what it means to pay. What does it mean to pay? Or talking on the phone, what does it mean to communicate with you? Um, can, is that something that you know I can fully do over the phone? Or is that something that we were never really meant to 
have limited that way in the first place. Like we've completely changed our, our definition of it, our understanding of talking. We've completely changed our definition of it, our understanding of, of payment. Um, it's true. Yeah. So, so that brings up a very, very interesting, very important point of what you said that this idea of the way we have progressed in society, the way that we have leveraged our human ingenuity to develop means and ways of doing to the extent where the doing is removed from us to a great extent with the least awareness of responsibility that we just can do about it. Literally there are like bank commercials that say just like there's a father playing with his children right. and everything's happening it's just like oh this is amazing and the value is like I get time with my children. It's like oh hang on clink and then that chore is done and there's more time with the kids which is very appealing. And I know that because of the show I'm watching on Hulu that commercial is being positioned there for me, right? Because I'm that demographic and I'm seeing it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm being worked right now. Mm-hmm. That, that's totally appealing, right? right? However, you said something like that shivers down my spine. That as I am distanced from the doing of it, I'm also distanced from several things that you listed my doing, my sacrificing, my life and cost, but my impact, my footprint of, of, of utilizing resource on this planet. So I posit this idea is that could it be that that detachment from the doing of is placing us in a position in a false sense of security, which is exemplified by all the science denialism that occurs, especially around climate uh, change. Is that what is positioning us to very broadly have this sense as individuals, in terms of how changes could impact our lives, to just say, I don't think it's really that big a deal. I don't know why everyone's freaking out about this. I mean, I put my recycling out, I do this, I do that, clink, 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 and it's a very facilitated life. But do those people then go further and further away from the real understanding of the fact that putting, filling your blue bin or filling your orange bin isn't necessarily changing the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, right? Like, I mean, those things go somewhere. And, yes. and so... And, and well, this is something that we that yeah, has yeah. been incredible for, for me personally to watch in the past few weeks. Um, this, this anti-straw yes. uh, movement. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it, and it's it's sort of challenging. I, I, you know, being in the environmental field and watching some, some of my colleagues just, like, roll their eyes at seeing, like, you know, Everybody, you know, who's saying like, oh, I didn't use a straw today. I have this. I bought this other plastic straw that I can reuse, and it's great, and everything. And um, and to you know, for, for a lot of people, it's um, it's it's a way, especially if, if the ocean isn't something that you have invested a lot of your charity in, um, but feel like you sort of want to, but don't know how to enter into it. It's great because they're ubiquitous, and they're it's easy sacrifice to make. Sure. Right. Um, for most people, it's an easy sacrifice. And yet, it is still, it is an action taken that provides the fulfillment of doing something good, but is still sourced in consumers. Like so, my so that's are the thing, is, is that the idea, as an environmentalist, you talk about like the, the influence of, of uh, advertisers. Mm-hmm. As an environmentalist, uh, we get into this really manipulative, there's a really dark side to, to sort of influencing people towards yes. charity. And, I mean, you know this. Fear, yeah. I mean, right. That, that, um, that is, but everyone uses fear for some right. reason. Right. Right. So, so, so the, there, there's this idea that, like, if we can if we can get people to just have something to put their hands on, they can do the work. And then we'll do the work of the actual, like, we'll do the actual environment work, but we'll, they can just stop using straws or something like that. And that, that's sort of, I like the idea, I love the idea that people have this restored vision of agency. But the problem, uh, not the problem necessarily, but I think that sort of this like underseen and under uh, expressed thing that's going on behind the scenes is kind of in this tiny microcosm of the straw. Uh, 
is that it's not about the the real evil isn't the function. Right? It's not a, it's not a fight against the function of the straw or or the practice of using the straw. Um, it's a it's, it really challenges the relationship we have to plastic, like the human relationship to plastic. Um, and that's the agency that, 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 that is sort of being restored to people, is that by being able to refuse single-use single use plastics, the hope for me is that there's this sort of question called into you of Plastic is something that is so separated in the same way that tech is from something I can tangibly understand as organic, as human, as so to say, like something physical, like plastic versus organic matter, um, something in the mind, human experience versus AI and tech. Mm -hmm. Like the things that differentiate those things, um, that they're so far apart. Um, What does it say that I have decided that I can use a product for three minutes and then I have made a decision that it will last thousands and thousands and thousands of years? So where does my authority to say that come from? Because I don't think it will last that long. Mm -hmm. I'm an organic thing that lives and dies, and I've made a decision 40 times in my day that something is going to far and long outlast me and my impact. And what do I have to say about what will it mean that I have lived? Uh, and so that's the sort of agency that that I want to to, or that I hope um, and that I've seen is sort of being reinstilled in people. It's not about using less plastics. It's about calling into question something that is that is because of its availability and because it's it's um, sold to us as a part of our experience. But really is separated, the community is just far separated from our, our experience, from, from humanity itself. Yeah. That it calls into question my relationship to those things and my relationship to longevity and permanence and, and impact. And it changes my understanding of my relationship to other things. And so if I, which I have so many times in my life, have just thrown things away without even thinking about it, how many individual ecosystems have I impacted? Um, and these are questions that no other um, organism has to ask themselves in their own ecological structures. Mm -hmm. So we have these ecological structures where we have a niche, we have a function. I have limitations up, I have limitations down. I have things that I can do, that's my agency that sits right in front of me. I have these tangible, actionable things, my practices that I can do. But at the end of the day, I'm limited by the things that come above me, like natural disasters or tornadoes and things like that. Like those are things I can't control, those are things above my actions. So I can go to work every day, but if a hurricane <laughs> comes in and takes away my workplace, then I don't get to make that decision anymore. But it's a limitation on my on my agency. Yeah. Um, which other which other other species and other sort of ecological Structures have very set and very defined, and it allows for the flourishing of individuals within their own limitations. Um, but we, because we have created things that are outside of ourselves and incorporated them into our identities, that we don't have that same conception of of, of limitations. And because we don't have that, we don't understand impact. And impact is something that we teach ourselves, something that we understand. Um, so let's let's do in terms of that, as you described the process of how we never tried this, because the real value of this conversation has gone into a very deeper philosophical space, right? So let's let's kind of tie it together with perhaps a thought experiment relative to humanity. And I can't really speak in terms of the scales of macro evolution because the real shifts in the human species that occur in a period of time that's like a drop in the bucket relative to the span of history, right? And I'm just 
We don't have to leave here because we can just exploit it to the best of our abilities for the food. We can just set up camp forever, right? Like, and then leave. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And then leave anyway, yeah. right? And do it again. But that awareness, which strangely I think comes from a space of social cognition more than anything else, you know, it wasn't really something that was much more I mean, I wasn't there, right? But the idea that when such practices first began, there was this likely idea of something that individuals who bought like and store food, it's not that different from, well, let Alexa order, right? Like it's the same instinct there that somewhere inside of us, like, can it can I be less impacted? Can things just happen for me, you know? Right. And if that is a, a very human trait that that perhaps began that uh, social evolution, cultural evolution. I wonder, in terms of the thought experiment, if we had a different type of awareness at that time as a species, and we did not, at least when it comes to our cultural and social evolution, develop ways and means, as you said, outside of ourselves to further that along. So that those then, you know, since we just they became inevitably technology because they were means that were non-human, non-organic, you know, and, and or some could have been organic, but you know, the idea like I and and, and I'm, I I tread lightly here because I'm not saying that you know ah well you know penicillin we don't really need that we can do it in some other way. Progress has had remarkable benefit. But it's like you said, you know, it's the, what am I doing this for? Why is it making this thing better? What is it really doing? It's questioning that. So if the outcome measure is a flourishing species that just takes over any ecosystem that it goes into and just dominates, then that's in Judeo-Christian scripture. You have been given dominion over the earth. Do as you will, right? So that's been somehow self-fulfilling in that way. But if we hadn't made those decisions, and we had chosen to stay in a greater awareness of how we were living in balance within the ecosystem that we were within, we, if we produced less, what then could the human species look like in the ways we reproduce, communicate, sustain our communities, how we live, how we think, how we act, how we use, how we consume, what could that look like? And why I say it's a thought experiment, because we've crossed out of we can't go back to that. But maybe that thought experiment can somehow inform changes we can start to make in practical and broad ways, because it's going to take a lot more people to get on board with this, to like change the, what is it, 10 billion by 2050, something like that. Oh my gosh. And, and I had a kid, you know? <laughs> And what do I say? Well, I didn't have four kids, you know. Right. I don't know. I mean, we all, it's right. its that kind of thing. Uh, it's individualized changes and shifts. But what could the human species look, have looked like if we didn't put our growth outside of ourselves in terms of agency, right? So, how do you envision that? So, that's something that, for me, I have loved turning to studies of cognition in animals, disease. Um, and in, um, yeah, just these not just non human animals, but also in, um, in uh, studies with people with other minds. So, um, lots of studies uh, of, <laughs> for example, like autonomy in infants um, have been really interesting, and the development of um, social structure, the development of morality, the development of um, these codes and rules and practices, studying the development of them in children um, has been really informative, to, especially when you look at different populations of children. For example, there have been a lot of studies of um, children of 
autistic children and children with Down syndrome that are um, just incredibly eye-opening uh, in terms of the way that we understand uh, how things like normative practices are, are developed or norms. Um, um, and also how, for me, another thing those, those, those um, studies, another thing those studies communicate is that um, there's a lot of communication happening that we um, don't hear because it's not in a language that we accept to understand. Um, and so, for example, um, I can talk about cognition. <laughs> um, it, is, it is if we are looking for something like altruism and empathy um, in species other than ourselves and non communal disease, um, and we use our metric, our understanding of our own. Um, uh, cognition and where empathy comes from, then we look for parts of the brain that are activated. We look for um, areas that are activated. We look for practices. We look for um, motions and gestures and communications and um, depending on species. Um, but for a spider that doesn't have a human brain, what should we look for? Mm. Uh, and in looking for a brain and saying, we don't have that, you must not have empathy, you must not have compassion, you must not have these things. Um, and then treating it as such, dividing that line, well, then where are we missing on? There, yeah. there is communication happening. There is, there is culture. There is, there is um, society. There is, uh, there, there are structures. There is behavior. There is um, communication occurring, but it's not in a language that we have uh, uh, deemed is meets the minimum requirements yeah. for understanding for us. And this is a huge problem in people in people who are nonverbal um, or patients with dementia um, who are seen as well, you're not communicating with me. Yeah. That's not what's happening. You've said the language. If the person in in in, in power and if the person who's determining communication sets the language, then then what is that? You know, it's remarkable that you're saying this because. I mean, there's so much synchronous and and everything we're talking about here, but the idea that you talked previously about fish, right, and where they are on a totem pole of value that we've set for how we understand and set value for the species that we, well, I think people think about this, whether we co-occupy this world with. I have not seen a more beautiful representation on film I mean, especially with IMAX, it's, it's an amazing thing. You know, technology, but it's so good. Um, but the idea of seeing a greater and more beautiful and more pure expression of interdependence than the movement of a school of fish, mm -hmm. or a flock of birds, or a colony of ants, or even fungi moving right. about like time stop or stop time, whatever that is, um, but like kind of sped up, you know, series, and you just see this colony of fungi just moving across a log or something like that. I think something like that may be frightening for people because different ways of seeing, different ways of being, different ways of existing seem like they somehow require us to relinquish the ego at times, this I am very singular way of thinking. Let's explore that thought. The idea that what we touched upon today, we just that concept of how there is such a representation of plurality, perhaps non judgment, acceptance openness, access, equity, interdependence, all of those things are there in a school of fish. I mean, you just you watch it and you're just that performance efficiency, whatever it is, on the job, we all have to work together and get this thing. 
does anything look like that? Does Japanese expressions of like Kaizen in terms of you know workplace efficiency and productivity? It happens and it happens so easily. But I think there's this deeper, not even mammalian, but perhaps just human subconscious understanding like for us to get there, it's gonna look so different. And that's terrifying. And think about like Star Trek, the board, right? Like that idea, or the machine world in the matrix, right. AI for that example. Right? This idea of this, you know, in the human sense, people you know speculate about like the neural sphere, all the you know collective consciousness, even in those spaces, just the idea that if we live in a different kind of balance, it just won't look like this anymore. And I don't know. In some weird way, you know, it's only weird because it's not according to the Roman standard. That appeals to me so much. Like I somehow just want to just kind of flow right into that kind of state of just kind of a collective awareness, moving in a way that can bring me to because the value I see there is bringing me so much more access to this feeling of knowing my place in it all, right? And I see that you know, with the cats that I live with, and they just you know they they're not going about the same kinds of things now. They also have a full bowl of food all the time, so right. there is that. But you know, why do we? Why why does any kind of deviation from the current understanding of how we live immediately mean that we have to just be on the brink of survival? Like we just have, we're not going to be able to make it because I say that to some of my friends, and you know, who even want to pursue in this middle-aged space of their lives, something different, do a different thing, go on a different path, seek a different fulfillment. And when they come into a space of feeling really like that's very daunting and it's filled with barriers, uh, you know, and if the expression is, come on, you know, just give it a shot. And there's these weird, like, just removal from the karma understanding and just immediately going to a space of saying something like, well, what am I going to do? Just take my family and live in a cardboard box, you know, under a bridge? And I'm like, hey, whoa. I don't think that's what we're talking about. I'm saying we live in a different way, especially for me, potentially, in a way where everything isn't defined by economic drivers, but rather drivers of some other kind of resource-based exchange, whatever, like 80% of people just be rising up in anger about this kind of statement, you know, at this point. But if these are all thought experiments, we're thinking along those lines. Let's think about that. Even in your own experiences, working with people in the spaces that you work, what's the resistance, right? What is the resistance around even just accepting an awareness of all of this? Like accepting that, oh man, this thing sucks, and just tossing it in the garbage and then it's done. Right? And this thing is made up of so many different pieces and things. There's metal, plastic, toxic stuff that will just seep into the ground. And half the is away, you know, and, and without thinking twice. So what's the resistance to a shift along those lines? What is, what is the resistance to an acceptance of where things are and our place in making them this way and progressing that further in a very unsustainable way? What's the resistance to that? Well, for one, our food bowls are always full. Nice, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I like it. You're right. In, I can't just say that on my cast. In my spaces in the world where their food bowls like, aren't full, that's where they're, that's where not the resistance, but actual change and actual like designing practices, better practices comes from. Like that's where that starts. It doesn't it's, it has to start out of fear and out of need, it seems. Um, that's that resistance that, that that you're asking about. I think it's a position of privilege for me to sit here and say, oh, this is all inquiry. It's yeah. so nice when it's inquiry yeah. and not survival. Um, and yet, per Maslow's hierarchy, yes. there is some middle space we have to come to where we can be comfortable enough to just do really yeah. what was originally said. It's not cutting off all this progress in technology. No. It's not just relinquishing, relinquishing every understanding of the way that we live for some other very alien understanding. It's just like you said about your colleague who has that particular, which I can't wait to look up, but particular type of you know foundational movement towards 
just mixing progress with a sense of justice. And that justice extends beyond the human diaspora but to the ecosystem, the life systems we live in, right? So, um, and yet, you know, that's definitely, as you say, it's easier said than done, but this is the thing we're talking about. You said it well. It does require these types of thought experiments, this type of, this type of inquiry, to come to a place where people on a very large, very macro social scale have something to hold on to that is an anchor into this way of thinking, this way of considering or reconsidering, or just taking a moment to think, to reflect, right? Stay in a reflexive space, maybe, I don't know, an hour a day, we commit that time to yoga, right? So like, just being in that, and, um, and yet, even those particular practices we can use, meditative practices, they tend to be co-opted into something very different. The yoga yeah. we do, the meditation that we do, the connection with this universe that we try to practice happens in a closed space, in some studio, in some right. removed capacity. Yeah, and it's a very individual experience yes. also. Uh, I've been the most informed by my work with um, people who are um, exploring, for people who are visiting the place where I work um, is on the grounds of the conservation burial grounds. And so there are people who come in and they will go at the site and they'll say, and, you know, they'll you know, walk around and drive around and walk around. Um, and they'll, they drive across this big, huge open area with this conservation easement on it, it's, it's restored land. Um, and it's just this just green, forested, really natural um, area. And I've been most informed by watching watching um, people and listening to the way that they talk about themselves and their planning. And because they're they're, pra they're doing the practice, they're planning, they're they're strategizing, but um, they're also communicating. Maybe they're not communicating this because this is what I think of. Um, the, 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 the end to the human capacity for growth and ingenuity and um, creativity and creation, um, the, the best of the human impulse towards all of those things and in all of those things. Um, is in, from what I've seen, um, is in knowing when to stop and, in, and in, in being able to sacrifice that and in not losing the, the value behind each of those individual things for the sake of growth itself mm -hmm. um, or for the sake of better. Um, And re realigning um, themselves with this idea that the greatest thing that I can do with my body and with myself um, is to know when to sacrifice it, and to know to know when to when it, to know how to let it be a thousand things later. So to give my body back to the earth so that it can be a thousand things, not to be Engaged in the, the real idea of permanence is not is not my name on a block in a marble case is not to encase and enclose and preserve, but is to let go, is to release, is to become something else, and to allow that becoming of something else. Um. So that that's sort of yeah, that's what I've been the most informed by in terms of like asking about. Progress and motion and actionables and like what's right in front of me, what's doable, what can I do, what will define. What a beautiful expression because as we have gone through this particular two weeks of podcast with others to kind of bring everything to a culminative expression of 
moving in the circle. We ask the individuals who share the circle with to all provide kind of an offer right. to, to send everyone on their way. This, out of all of this, especially in this moment, I've gained a particular understanding and I offer it forward. And, and you, which I want to mark in every moment that we share this type of exchange and, and kind of co journey through a narrative, you've always done that very organically. No pun intended, you know, relative to your experience, but you've always come to a sense of providing a beautiful kind of offering. When you connected restorative justice as a particular type of work and a particular type of social stratum to everything else. That was a beautiful synergistic expression, right? A synthesis, you, you did that. And today you did it beautifully in just what you said, that it is something as simple as knowing how other humans used not only their lives, but also used their death to serve the greater experience. Uh, that's one, right? that's, that's beautiful because that, I think, in its simplest way, expresses where our consciousness shifts really has to go, is that we, we aren't, we can't make the earth something that is outside of us, ourselves. We can't encase and encapsulate it as a mark of our time here, like a old, like a, you know, Ozymandias, you know, here lies the king of kings, yeah. Well, not yet. It's a ruined, you know, kind of testimonial to this random person's existence buried in like the desert sands, right? So right. dust to dust, and it, it'll, it'll all come there. And yet, the idea that we do make the decision that our greatest legacy is something that has no relative purpose and exists for a thousand years beyond us. Us. Now maybe 10,000 years from now, people will be like, whoa, here's the new fuel source. All this plastic was buried everywhere. Now we can use it to do something. That could be the hope, but um, that certainly isn't the current intention. We're not doing it for that reason. You know? So um, thank you for sharing this particular yeah. space because you know when we've done these particular types of you know, finding our way into a very broad theme, we could have gone any which way about it, but you synthesized something that was a beautiful expression today, so I really appreciate that. This is my hope that this is just the start relative to this. I can't wait to be on your podcast yeah. whenever that comes to together yeah, and yeah. with different people, you know, and kind of, I, I don't know. I think you should definitely precipitate that as quickly as possible because we need that, right? This is also a collective communication and awareness raising. We have to, more and more of us have to do this uh, because even when it comes to, you know, the, the technological tool of the podcast or this type of narrative exchange, it's not all about this. You know, it's other stuff, you know, better business or doing it this way or, you know, something, something that, again, that always focuses to the individual but not to a collective awareness. So, um, yeah, this is amazing. How do you feel? I feel great. Is it good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good? Okay, that's good, that's good. Because I think it'll, this is going to be, um, this is all been synchronous. Every one of these has been a remarkable, and we're always going to be large, right? So, this has been awesome. I'm glad that this has been a mark, because for this particular series and the space that it comes from, who's sponsoring it, and the environment is a very big, very politically charged, very huge topic. And there's no easy way to go in that can kind of open up to everyone, right? I mean, usually there's some spot where people tune out. I'm sure people are, oh, who are they? What are they talking about now? You know, sure, but if you if you dwell with it, I think this narrative has been something that everyone. So, um, 